I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to be here with you to talk about the exciting work that's going on in long-term care to change the culture of nursing homes and to transform them into places to live. So in my time with you, I'm going to be talking about what is culture change, what is the Pioneer Network, and what is this movement all about, and to connect you and your work to this movement. So that's one of my, that's one of my dreams. So, <laughs> so what's in your bucket list? You know that movie with Jack Nicholson, Things You Want to Do Before You Die? One of my dreams is to be a rocket. <laughs> so anything else? Oh, skydive, you and George Bush. Brave, good. What do you want to do? Raise your hand, just shout something out. Travel the country in an RV. Travel the country in an RV. How many people have that dream? I think a lot of us do. Boy, that was been one of mine. Well, I'm not hearing any of us saying that uh, on our bucket list is someday to live in a nursing home, to leave our home community and to um, trade that in to live in a hospital institutional setting, to uh, live among strangers, to share a room with a stranger and have strangers provide personal care for us, to leave our meaningful activities, to leave our daily routines that we've had all our lives, to leave our belongings and our whole community support system, our pets, our relationships, to wear diapers because we're told to poop in our pants because it's more convenient for staff than to toilet us. And it's not on our bucket list, is it? I came into this field as an ombudsman in 1991, 92, and I was brand new. I was so new, fresh eyes. I had never even been in a nursing home. That's how new I was. I had never been in a nursing home. And when I applied for the job, I said, you know, you may not want to hire me because I don't know anything about medicine. I don't know anything about nursing homes. And she said, we want someone with fresh eyes. We want somebody who's not vested in the system, but somebody will come in with fresh eyes. And so after about three or four months, she said, OK, time to go do a case. And we've got a good one, uh, a home called. And they have a problem with a gentleman who is urinating in the plants. And so um, they don't know what to do with him, and they want us to come and help, which often happens, you know. It, you know often the homes will uh, call the ombudsman program to help them with a, with a situation. And so off we go. And when we got to the home, she said, now I'm going to go and do the intake, you know, talk to this gentleman, and I'd like you to walk around and just make observations, you know, from the training you went through, and just look around and, and get some impressions, and then we'll hook up a little later. So I'm walking around this place, and I have to tell you, I know what it's like to be an alien coming into a foreign environment. This was unbelievable to me, to see people tied up. This is 1991, 92. Restraints were still widely used. People were tied up. They were in these jerry chairs, their arms and legs flailing. They were um, screaming out. I could hear screams from faraway places. I went into the dining room. There was a meal time, and there was a stressed out caregiver. Her face just looked squashed and stressed with this horseshoe trying to feed five people at a time. And this other gentleman had fallen into a soup. I thought he was going to drown. I didn't know whether to go for help. I could not believe this. So Sharon came and got me, and she said, OK, um, come with me. I want you to talk to this man. I want to see how you will approach him and ask him questions, find out what's going on. So I sat with, with this fellow. His name was Doug. And I listened to his story. And I'm listening to him. And I'm asking him questions. And I'm thinking, this doesn't add up. There's nothing wrong with this guy. What's going on? So I boldly asked. I said, gee, Doug, you really seem fine to me. What's going on with the urinating and the plants? And he said, it got you here, didn't it? <laughs> and that was my first aha, right there. That was my first aha, that behavior is not a problem. 
it's a symptom and it's a, it's a way to communicate. And he was communicating, get me out of here, which we did, and that actually became my specialty, um, springing people. Uh, um, and I used to love to, there were a lot of people who were institutionalized that really could be out in the community with services. And, and we got a lot of those calls and I, it was brought I me mean, a lot of gratification to have them live on their own. Even sometimes it was only for another year, but it was great. So we're leaving this nursing home, and I'm, to this day, I can still remember walking to that door, past these residents in these chairs with their arms outstretched. Help me, help me, help me. And my eye was on that door, and I couldn't get to that door fast enough. And we got outside, and Sharon was scooting right behind me, and she said, you're going to quit, aren't you? <laughs> And I said, well, that was tough. If there was a hell, I was in it. And I said, I won't quit, but if you let it be part of my job to go out there and see if there's not another way, if there's not somebody that has a vision for another way of doing this, I'll stay. But it's got to be part of my job. And she said, that's fine, because she had so much invested. You know what it's like when you run the ad, and you interview, and you hire, and you train. You know, it's like. <laughs> so she said, you know, that's fine. That's fine. Um, Absolutely, you can do that, and so I did. Every day, all across this country, we are doing in practice things that are um, harmful and violate people's basic human rights, and we do it all in the name of good care. So I'd like you to look at this line. This is your lifeline. Now, it could be a circle if you wanted to make it a circle, however you would want it to be, but this is your lifeline, and I'd like you to look at that line and to ask you at what point along that line or at what age are you willing to give up your self-determination? Your right to choose, to have choice, to have control over your life, to your control to make decisions about simple things, even like when you're going to get up, when you're going to go to bed, when you're going to eat, what you're going to eat how your day is going to be and what you're going to do with your day. Think about where along there are you willing to just give that up? When along that continuum are you willing to give up your right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? You don't sound like you mean that. When? Never. 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 The people in our care in nursing homes and all these settings right now are just like us. They're just an older version of us. And they didn't want this for themselves either. If you talk to these people, this isn't what they wanted for themselves. And they're just an older version of us. You know, inside of us is an elder growing. Did you know that? <laughs> if for some reason there was a misfortune and this afternoon you needed to move into a home, I'd like you to think about three things that you would want the staff to know about you that would help you hang on to your sense of home and your sense of self that you won't compromise on. Who would like to share? Privacy. Privacy. No. No. Uh, you're going to live in a fishbowl now. <laughs> Everybody's going to know what you're doing all the time. Doors are open. We don't like closed doors. We don't know what people do behind closed doors. So uh, no privacy. Get up late? No. We start getting people up 5 o'clock, sometimes earlier if we're short-staffed, but 5, 6 o'clock, nobody sleeps in. I think there's a regulation that says that people can't sleep in. I don't know. <laughs> what was yours? A shower every day. It's not good for your skin. Uh, plus, we don't have the staff to do that, and plus... You're going to be on a routine of uh, a bath, maybe. You might not even get a shower. You may be on the bath schedule. So uh, that's not going to happen. Pick your own roommate? <laughs> no, this is not a club med or something. We're just, <laughs> you go where there's a room available. So how many people want to come? Yeah, and the problem is it's not only my home, but the home down the street and the home across town 
in the home across state, in the home across the country, 16,000 nursing homes. Yeah, there are some exceptions, especially now because this movement's been around a while. But for the most part, we're describing in an exaggerated way um, some of the things that you have to leave behind if you're going to come and live in this setting. And, and we didn't even mention some of the um, pleasurable things, you know, that words that start with S. That's the hat we have to have on, is what do we want for ourselves? We have to start thinking about the consumer point of view. What's it like to be a resident from our own perspective? Because that's where it starts. It starts with what we would want, what are our expectations. Well, there's the vision. It's right in the Nursing Home Reform Law of 1987. That it's no longer acceptable to treat people just their physical part, but to treat their mind, their body, and their spirit, to help people reach their highest practicable level, their highest potential, treat people as an individual, and to do it in a home setting. There it is. I mean, the law is bigger than that, but there it is. So I had to find the people that were doing something with this. Now, that was 1987, and interestingly enough, 1992 now is when that law was written into regulation. People didn't know what to do with it, so we started holding community forums, bringing people together to talk about this. And I met a woman, Carter Williams, you may have heard of her name. She was a national leader in the restraint-free care movement. And through her and through the reading I was doing, uh, I became aware of some people who were doing some pioneering work. And so um, became familiar with them and their work, and in 1997, we were fortunate to get a little grant to bring them together, plus some other people, some researchers and regulators and surveyors, and HICFA at the time, the new CMS, 33 of us in all, and we spent three days together, gathered to talk about their work in this new vision. Now, there are other people, and there were other people at this meeting, but we focused on the work of these four people because they were all published and had written, and we knew a little bit more about them. And so we found that all of the people doing this pioneering work began with the experience of a resident. What's it like to be a resident? Well, Charlene Boyd and Bob Ogden out in Oregon said to be a resident means you give up control and you give up your home setting. So what they did was they knocked out some resident rooms and they made a country kitchen and they flattened their hierarchy. I know that's scary stuff, but they did. Nobody lost their job, but they flattened that hierarchy and they returned the, the control and the decision making to the residents to decide how they wanted um, to live. And those little households that they created managed their own budget and that's where the decisions were made. The Barkins in California said to be a resident means that you are isolated, disconnected, and life has no meaning. And so their approach was to um, create a re regenerative community, bring people together, a sense of belonging to each other. Um, every day you come together and you're in community and you talk about what's going on in the world and what's going on in the nursing home and you welcome new people and you plan activities and you build that new sense of history, you know, that new history together and a sense of belonging. Joanne Rader, I hope you bring her here someday. She's just absolutely over-the-top nurse. She would have left long-term care if it wasn't for this pioneering work. She was so discouraged. She's a national leader in the restraint-free care movement. And her approach is, um, she said, to be a resident means that you give up all of your familiar uh, routines, and they're all the comfortable routines, and that you have to be regimented to the routines of the nursing home and to the setting. And so her approach is individualized care. Now, what I admire about her is that she had her staff give her a bath. Who would do that? Look at 200 people in this room and not one of you. Not one of you? That was going to be the activity this afternoon. <laughs> But Joanne did this, and her staff, you can imagine that they just did their best practices, right? I mean, they were on their best. And she didn't get very far into this process, and her feet started turning purple, and she felt assaulted, and she said, stop, stop. You know, 
There's got to be a better way. So she has designed a lot of new ways of keeping people clean without making them feel assaulted and in a more dignified way. And her work is called Bathing Without a Battle. And every nursing home in this country got the DVD. So if you don't know about this, go home and start looking at those shelves. And then, of course, the Thomases in New York, um, Bill and Judy, they said to be in a nursing home means you are lonely, helpless, and bored out of your mind. And their approach is a socially and biologically diverse environment with lots of plants and animals and children. But what we are finding is these approaches and all the other approaches that have been developed since starts with the values. What are our assumptions? What are our beliefs? What are our values? So if your place of work does not have a mission, vision, value statement, that would be one place to start. And then you take every one of those values and you look at what are you doing in practice to express that value, just like in your personal life. If you're, if you're an honest person, that's a value, a principle, then what do you do? You live your life, you walk the talk. And this is the other major point. Don't get confused by the names. It's the same work. It's all about expressing your common values. So I am going to go through the values that we came up with that weekend. And all of these approaches, all the homes on the journey, they may reword this, but they all get at the same kinds of things in their values. It's about knowing who these people are. Everybody can make a difference. And this is one of the most important values is that relationship is the fundamental building block. Respond to the spirit as well as the mind and the body. We talked about that. That's in the nursing home reform law. Risk taking is a normal part of life. We have one of our researchers who says, living in a nursing home is like a medically safe passage to death. You know, we keep people in saran wrap. We keep them so sterile, so protected that they're not even uh, living. Put the person before the task. So often it's about getting those tasks done in the most efficient way. Get those trays collected, you know, and meanwhile call lights are going off and um, people need to be toileted, but I can't do that because I've got to get these trays up or I'll get written up. Elders are entitled to self-determination wherever they live. We've talked about that a little bit. The physical environment to create a home setting it's the psychosocial spiritual. It's the way you live and work together and interact together and the relationships. And then you have to change your organization and all of the systems to support working in this new way. You are a pioneer. So you have that pioneering spirit and you know that it can be better. As good as things might be in the old traditional way, you know that it can be better. And you, I think, are coming with a willing and open mind to, to be part of, of this. And so. That's what we did. We just kept traveling around the country and we rallied around uh, this vision statement, a culture of aging that affirms life. Now, this is all new assumptions. If you affirm life, that means these people aren't here to die, are they? They're here to live. Even if there's only 2% wellness, you work with the part that's well and you help them have a quality of life in their days with, with, with what they have. It's satisfying. There's that pleasure work at word again humane. And I'm sorry to be the messenger, but some of the practices are not humane. And it's meaningful for all, for staff and residents. And this is what our mission is, is to advocate and facilitate this change in the culture of aging. So that was 13 years ago, that the, and the Pioneer Network grew out of that. Pioneer Network is an organization. We're now a not-for-profit organization. We're the big tent. We help states form coalitions. We have a speakers bureau, a website. We have some publications and some resources that we've developed, plus other people's. So we're like a clearinghouse. Um, you can you know, contact the Pioneer Network if you need speakers, resources, materials, connections. Um, we're content specialists. We're a convener. As Catherine said, we've held 10 national conferences, and our numbers are growing. We're up over 1,200 people, 48 states and other countries. So who are these pioneers? 
Well, there are a growing number of individuals around the country just like you and me. And we know that it can be better and we want to create our own future because when we look into the future like we did just a little while ago, we don't like what we see and we don't want it for ourselves. And you know what? I'm not waiting around, I don't know about you, for government to fix this. We have to have a grassroots movement and that's what's happening and it is happening. We have healthcare workers, we have researchers, regulators, advocates, journalists who write about this. Beth Baker wrote a book, Old Age and a New Age. Wonderful book if you want to read that. We have educators, union reps, consumers. We have attorneys, financial people, all the stakeholders, just like we have gathered here, are actively engaged. And that's the operative word. This is not a membership organization. This is a network of change agents, people engaged in the work, whether they're of any of the disciplines that I just um, mentioned. Are you dissatisfied with the current system? It's just got problems everywhere. But the one that's the most disheartening in the residents themselves in recent surveys say 70% are unwilling to go to a nursing home and like 30% say they'd rather kill themselves than go to a nursing home. Now, can you imagine that? And they do, don't they? They take each other behind the barn and shoot each other or, you know, they, they do these things because it's such a dreadful place. Now, this is a business that we're talking about. And like when our, when our automotive industry finds out that we've got problems, what do they do? They change. So the message is people do not want what is being delivered. And we have to hear that message and we need to, to change it. And for good reason, because they're the ones that do all of the adjusting. You know, it's Mrs. Smith moved in and she's adjusting well. What we should be saying is, Mrs. Smith moved in and we're adjusting to her in her routine and trying to make this her home. So what are the current residents having to compromise to adjust to living? Judith Carboni in 1990 did her graduate research on homelessness among the institutionalized elderly. What are the elements of home? And then what are the elements of homelessness? And what she found is that on the elements of home is where there's a strong, re fluid relationship with the environment. And on homelessness, on the other side, a person experiences severely damaged and a tenuous relationship between the person and the environment. And that the people who are institutionalized elderly are more associated with the homelessness side of that spectrum, which is really, um, an indictment. The industrial model, this institutional, traditional model of care is to treat people to, and to do it in the most sympathetic, empathetic way possible and caring way possible. You nurture them and all of that, but you also provide love and relationship and meaningful life together. So we need a whole new definition of care that's based on individualization and choice self-determination, relationship, and to create a model that gets away from that industrial model and we humanize long-term care. And that requires what we call a paradigm shift, which means we're gonna build this on all new assumptions. Another way of saying it, it's a cultural shift. It's um, culture based on new assumptions. So what is culture? Doesn't that lead us to that question? What is culture anyway? This is one definition, you can find lots of them, but they have the same elements. It's a system of shared values, here we go again with the values, symbols, beliefs, rituals, performance styles that characterize and coalesce a group. And so you'll find, I'll give you part of the answer, you're going to find that you've got a culture, a main culture, and you're gonna have subcultures. There's a culture among the direct care workers. There's a culture with senior management. Culture is very complicated. Become an observer. We're going to start with values. And again, th these are the questions about values because everything you do sends a message. Everything you do sends a message. So what is your value? And you write that down. You know, we, this is our value. We believe in respect and dignity and autonomy, okay? That's a lot on a lot of value statements. What do we do in practice to express that value? 
Well, in the black and white picture, the resident often is not included in the admission process, is she? Because we have so many admits to get in that day, that's what we call them, not people, but admits. We talk to the family because we can get through this a whole lot faster. So are we living our value and walking the talk? No. And then what's the message that we are sending? The message we're sending is, oh my gosh, I'm and move in day, I've lost all control right out of the get-go. I'm not being consulted or part of this at all. So what is the value? What do you do in practice? What's the message you're sending? And as consumers, you and I as consumers, are gonna want the place we move in to walk the talk. If we ask to see the value statement and they say these things, we're gonna want to see that done in practice. And that's what we want to do. So time and space. In a traditional home, you have the long double loaded corridors. The hallways are loaded with all kinds of supplies. The nurse's station is control central because who's really in charge here? What's the name of the place? Nursing home, the nurses, this is their home. And the residents know that because where do they hang out? <laughs> nurses station. And when no one's around, they even answer the phone. <laughs> they take doctor's orders. We've got stories, we've got stories. So we will expect as consumers that this home is gonna follow our routine, aren't we? That, that when we get up, when we go to bed, what we like to do, on the weekends you wanna get up at 11, and we're gonna write it in a care plan that is gonna be written in our own voice. So when people are reading that, it's Mrs. Smith's voice saying, I, this is what I need to have a good life here. Relationship, that is the fundamental building block and you have relationship, whether it's plants, animals, children, other residents. Consistent assignment. This is when the same workers are with the same residents. You know how that works in a nursing home? You start out on the first floor because you're kind of functioning, and then something happens and you move to the second floor, and then you get a little dimension, you move to the third floor, then you get lots of dimension, you move to the fourth floor, and all along that resident's saying, oh boy, here I go, up and up. And you have new caregivers every time. You have a whole new set of people having to get to know. Look at these pictures. We call the people on the left the slumpers. We see these people come to life. I have witnessed this. I would not say this to you if I hadn't witnessed it. People who have never talked start talking. People who have never been engaged in life become engaged in life. If you went to Metal Lark Hills in Kansas, you would not see anybody who looks like that. And people say to Steve all the time, oh, well, you can do culture change because these people aren't as old and sick and frail as the ones in my home. Oh, yeah. But they come to life when life has meaning. What you are doing is getting you what you're getting. So if you want to get something different, you have to do something different. And Steve Shields gives us a direct challenge. He says, sit and hold the hands with a slumping resident until you feel the relationship between her state of being and your leadership. When it comes to staff and when it comes to culture and when it comes to resident culture, whether you like it or not, what you see in your home is a mirror and is reflecting back your leadership. Ouch. Governance, rules. In a traditional nursing home, you get these triangles or these little boxes, and everybody works in a box, and one box doesn't talk to the other box. Social workers have all this wonderful knowledge about these residents, but the nurses don't know anything about it because they don't talk to each other. Or I love the one where piece of paper's on the floor. Oh, piece of paper on the floor. I'll call housekeeping. <laughs> Come to, you know, wherever because it's not my job, right? Call light goes off. It's not my job. That's why I became a nurse. I'll call a direct care worker. I'll get a direct care worker away from working with a, with a resident to come and do something because it's not my job. That's my, it's not my job. And then you get this triangle. At the base of the triangle are the direct care workers. And at the little pinnacle at the top is where all the power and control is in the office, tucked way back that nobody ever sees the administrator. So any ideas that come up 
from the direct care workers have to go up the rungs of the ladder? Because, you know, the direct care worker can't talk to the administrator directly. We have to go through the protocols and talk to our supervisor, who talks to her supervisor, who talks to her supervisor. By the time it gets up there, who knows? It's like grapevine. Who knows what was ever asked or suggested? And sometimes it's like it defies gravity. The answers don't even come back down again, do they? So we have disgruntled workers out in the parking lot. I don't understand it. I work with these residents. I know these people. Nobody listens to me. And they're disgruntled. Well, here's a good picture. That's not my job. <laughs> so we were looking for a new way to organize that puts the resident on the chart. You know, I don't know about you as a consumer, but me as a consumer, if I have any wits about me at all, I'm going to want to be on the board. You know, it's my home. I don't know where you live at your house, but at my house, I have a lot of say about what happens. And I'm going to want to um, be involved in my home. So you get scenes like this, where people are actually happy. And there is a direct care worker who is happy, and she is sitting down with residents, and she's not going to be written up for sloughing off. It's in her job description. There's another thing that has to change. Everything changes. The way you hire people, the way you supervise people, the power and authority they have, and their job description, that you want them to do one-on-one -on -one and to be with the residents and to know them and not be um, written up. So objects used in everyday life. We get rid of the trays, and not in 60, 100 people don't eat in a room together. You, you eat in the household with 8, 10, 12 people, just like you would at home, with real dishes, real table settings. And it's wonderful to see direct care workers, and we come from a different world now, where a lot of people just eat on the run. And the older residents are teaching the younger direct care workers how to set a table properly. And it's wonderful to see the relationships blossom, and it gives them something to talk about. So small groups of people. In residents' room, the one on the right is with her own belonging. Hey, yeah, bring in your horse collection. Bring in your books. Bring in the things that are yours and meaningful and personalize your room. The one on the left reminds me of the story about a woman in Rochester who moved into a home or facility, I should say, in a setting like that, a hospital bed. And she said to my, my former boss, Sharon, um, she was a professional in the community and worked for social services and ended up living there. And she said, um, Sharon, would you draw that, that curtain so we could have some privacy? And so Sharon did, and she said to Sharon, I never thought I'd end up living in a tent. Oh, outdoors, lots of people. I would think in Georgia when you have a whole year of nice weather, being outdoors is just part of who you are and what you love to do. And then uh, the ways that we celebrate and grieve, that also makes up our culture. And this is the nursing home when it's somebody's birthdays. They're all celebrated on the second, third Thursday of the month. But when you are 100 years old like Francis here, you don't want to wait till the Thursday to celebrate your birthday. You know, you want your birthday to be celebrated right on your birthday. You may not be around for that third Thursday, so you want to be there. Death and dying. Nursing homes are a microcosm of our attitudes about old people. Who lives in nursing homes? Who lives there? Old people. Old people. They're primarily what gender? Female. Female. Our society does not place a lot of value on old people or old women in particular. And you know this because follow the money. The money is not going there. So you can always see what our priorities are. You can look at a nursing home. It's almost like you can look inside and you can see all kinds of things played out in our society. You can see racial issues played out. You can see economic issues played out. You can see our attitudes towards sex played out because my staff isn't comfortable with sex and you can't have it, you know? <laughs> Just, um, <laughs> it's, and so our attitude on death and dying is also played out in the nursing home. 
We don't say, I'm sorry your mother died. I mean, the word died and death just, you know, we, we, okay, I'd say, I'm sorry your mother expired, like yogurt, you know. <laughs> um, or she passed, like she took a test and, hey, she passed, now she gets to go in. Um, or, oh, I love the one where we lost Mary last night. Did you look under the bed? You know, maybe she's... But, you know, that's how we, you know, we just are not comfortable with it. And that's played out in the nursing home, and I'm going to describe how. Kim and I are roommates, and I die. What happens? Everybody goes into their room. Kim gets removed, and they come, and they wheel me out down the hall and the elevator down out the loading dock, and I'm gone. Not a word is said. Kim gets a new roommate. Kim looks around and says... People disappear around here. <laughs> oh dear, I guess that's going to happen to me. Nobody knows that I'm here. I'm going to die. And, and so she gets depressed. And so we give her drugs. The staff. I know this. Nurses and social workers have told me, direct care workers have told me, be professional. Don't get attached to these people. They're going to die. Just be professional. And so what happens is you can get attached to somebody by w doing a walkthrough. I have had residents come up to me and charm me to the point where I want to just take them home. They are so, you cannot help but get attached to some of these folks instantly. So what happens, somebody went and got attached to me, and then when I die, um, they feel bad, and we find people hiding their grief. They're in bathrooms, they're in closets. Not only direct care workers, administrators, chaplain, housekeeping, maintenance people, and that robs us of our humanity. So what happens to the family member? I used to get calls as an ombudsman. Oh my goodness, my mother died. Everybody's out of town. We finally come to, you know, to make the plans and everything, and I go to pick up her things and I'm delivered them in a black trash bag. Now I don't care how old your mother is. I don't care if you knew she was going to die, but there's something about when she finally dies, it's still, you know, something, grief and something to deal with, and that's, um, you know, very, very difficult. Well, I told you that my mother lived at Fairport, and her, that was her final home. And my mother died there, too. And they have a ritual at Fairport that's really very nice. After she died, we were able to stay with my mother as long as we wanted to. And then when we were ready, uh, they came in and they uh, washed her face and they put this beautiful afghan around her. And they went out and they, they don't use their overhead pager anymore. They all have these wireless um, pagers. And so the only time they use it is to announce that someone has died. And so they have a, a chime. And over the loudspeaker, it's chime, chime. Chime, Yolanda Capana. That's all it said, and everybody knows that Yolanda Capana has died. And so, within 10 minutes, um, other residents, family members, staff, whoever knew my mother wants to be part of this, comes and we all gathered in this room, and someone does a little bedside memorial service. It's all written out, and it could be anybody. It could be the administrator, direct care worker, housekeeping, whoever is comfortable, it doesn't have to be a chaplain, reads this little prayer, and then afterward, the um, staff started sharing stories about my mother and our family, and, and then we started sharing stories that we had and the gratitude that we had to be part of that community, to, um, to be there with all these people, and to be part of a team that did help my mother get up and walk again and she did walk through our front door for her last Thanksgiving and her last Christmas with us. And so we, you know, were very grateful for that and for the fun that we had. And my mother, you know, they were commenting my mother's humor and and um, and so we had that time and it just brought such closure and an opportunity for us to to share our feelings at that time. And then before we leave the room. We all walk up to my mother, everyone, one by one, just like at, at calling hours, and said our last goodbye, our last um, final goodbye to her. And I thought to myself, how important this is to the residents, because especially, there, it, it could be generational, but um, 
it's very important for people of that generation to see people, you know, people don't just disappear, that you get to see them dead and you acknowledge that death. And, and so that they had that opportunity to experience that. And then, yes, there's a memorial service and all of that, but just to um, say their goodbye. And so after we all did that, we went and gathered out in the kitchen, and the funeral director came, and uh, they have these beautiful shrouds. The one for my mother was a handmade one from Yugoslavia, and they draped the gurney with that, and, and you know, by this time she was in a bag, and so they dra draped the, the gurney with that. And then we had a procession out through the kitchen, out the side door to the hearse, and it was so dignified. Not only for my mother, who was a very dignified woman, but for the staff. You know, it just brings dignity to their work, that they were with someone in life, and that we were celebrating a life, a life that she had there, not a passage to death. And, um, and we just all felt like better people and humans um, as a result of that. Now, this was at Fairport Baptist Homes, and Fairport Baptist Homes has a value that they believe in the sanctity of life and the sacredness of death. And part of their journey was to take every one of their values, and they said, okay, so what do we do in practice? Oh, we have a memorial service, yeah. What else? Oh, my goodness. The first scenario that I described about going down the elevator and out onto the loading dock, that's what they did. And they said, oh, no, that doesn't express that value. We have to come up with a more sacred practice. And then they came up with this ritual. We're moving away from this model where it's the staff's facility and everybody works in departments on their own. And we're moving to a model that nurtures the human spirit, that it's the residence routine that we want to keep. We have consistent assignment and relationship. The residents are making decision. It's spontaneous activities. It's not only organized, regimented ones, and that we work as a team and that we know each other as people. We don't get from A to Z overnight. It's a journey. And we start out very provider-directed in a very institutional-directed um, setting and how, over time, as we change our practices, we move over to it being more staff-centered and we get to the point where it is person-centered, where it's the resident we're trying to create home and rampant normalcy by having smaller living environments, consistent assignments so we can have relationship. The decision making is close to the resident. We flatten that hierarchy to make that happen. And we have daily routines that encourage freedom and choice. And you know, it's so upsetting because good people work in these homes. It's not about the people. It's about the system. I don't know who created it, and I wouldn't want to spend two minutes on trying to figure that one out. Uh, we do, we don't think that person has long to live. This movement is not about knowing this stuff. It, it's a call to action to get rid of this dysfunctional system. It's a dinosaur. This is my little travel companion. This is Reggie. Reggie. The people in Florida named him years ago, and it stands for Regimentation and Regulation. That's what drives this dysfunctional system, is regimentation and regulation. We are expected to march when we want to dance to the rhythm of our, of our residents. Wanting to dance when we're expected to march. That's what we want to do, is to be in a dance rhythm with these residents and enjoy our life with them. But it is more regimented than the military. I have had administrators who have been in the military and said, this environment is more regimented than a military environment. So that's why he's called uh, Reggie. And I will say that I doubt that if a day goes by in your place of work that the word regulation and reimbursement aren't mentioned. <laughs> that's what drives the system. This is what um, Steve Shields says, and I love that last sentence. There is nothing in the regulations, in the federal regs, we've been through them, there's nothing in there. And what everyone is slow to realize is that OBRA 87, the nursing home reform law that I talked about earlier, edicts dismantling this beast. I love it. So why isn't this happening faster? What's, what's going on here? Well. There's lots of reasons, and people love to hide behind lots of these reasons. They say that you can't do it because of the regulation. Well, that's a myth. 
you can't do it because it costs too much. Well, we have a business case, several of them now, research done on the business case that shows that it is cost neutral when you move to this new way. Now, if you hang there with two systems in place, it's going to cost you more. There's this much money, and this is how it's divided. But then you start dividing it differently. You know, money that you're saving from here, you move over here. So there are some areas that are more expensive, but there are cost savings. So the same amount of money distributed differently. But the number one reason that it fails and that the biggest barrier is resistance. It's our own limitations and our own thinking that this isn't going to happen. Well, I am here to tell you culture change is here to stay. This is not a fad. And you know that because you don't want it for yourself. If you're truly honest, as good as your facility is, you wouldn't want to live there. And yet, we provide services to people that we wouldn't want for ourselves. Now, we say we have the business case, and the business case is built on a lot of positive outcomes that support this, especially where it comes to staff retention and when it comes to cost. But think of the bottom line as I go through this. Cost savings, that disengaged look disappears. You know, the slumpers, remember? They become more engaged in life. They help set tables. They help do laundry. The money that goes out the door into a furnace with agency temporary staff, with staff turnover, the number of direct care workers who go through the CNA training is huge. They come in the front door and in three months they're out the back door. We got to plug that, you know, plug the dike. People come into this world as natural caregivers, you know, the helpers. They're, they're, they're born in the help, to serve in the helping service industry. But what are we doing to create such a horrid environment that they don't stay? So these are all things to look at. Higher occupancy rate. I don't know about you, but if I've got private dollars and I have a choice between going to uh, an old traditional institutional model or one where I'm going to have my own routines in a home setting, I'll use my money to go where I am going to receive the service that I want. The word of mouth, the reputation in the community, that's where people want to go. The special diets. People are more mobile, they're more engaged in life, there's less depression, less falls, less hospitalizations. Especially when the direct care workers work with the same people all the time, they pick up those little nuances like, gee, Mrs. Smith, she's a little off today, can't put my finger on it, but something's a little different. We keep an eye on it, find out it's the beginning of a, of a UTI and you know, you, you pick up those little nuances, less hospitalizations, intergenerational contact. A lot of the homes have daycare centers right on site. And not only on site, but right up on the floors. And so it's not just kids passing through, but kids in relationship where the, where the residents are um, reading and helping kids with homework and, you know, really engaged and they know people by name. I love the one about lower mortality rates. Now, you can't fudge death, you know? You can't say, oh, look, nobody here dies. But we are finding that people live longer because when life has meaning and they're engaged and they have relationship, they live longer. That's a stunning, stunning outcome. We have this definition of an elder that we get from Barry Barkin. An elder is a person who is still growing, still a learner, still with potential, and whose life continues to have within it promise for and connection to the future. An elder is still in pursuit of happiness and joy and pleasure, and her or his birthright remains intact. And moreover, an elder is a person who deserves respect and honor and whose work it is to synthesize wisdom from long life experience and formulate this into a legacy for future generations. This country has a long ways to go to grow into that great big definition, but that's the work of the Pioneer Network. That's the work of you that we have before us. One of our values is that everyone can and does make a difference. Everyone matters in the organization, and we have leadership at all levels. Everyone can be a leader, and this movement needs leaders. But you may be saying to yourself right now, who am I to change the world? But what we need to be asking is, if it's not me, then who? And if it's not now, then when?
When is this going to happen? So we need to be champions. And as a champion, we need to be advocates. We need to educate and facilitate. It's our responsibility to embrace this new culture and to ask ourselves, where can I make a difference? In the not too distant future, when nursing homes as we know them are going to disappear, they're gonna fall by the way of the asylum. We're still gonna have nursing homes. We're gonna need them for a long time to come. But they are going to be reinvented and they're going to be different. And the care practices that destroy, that are harmful and destroy the human spirit that we are doing now, things like restraints that are still going on, and the things that we're doing that are harmful, we're going to look back at this period and we're going to say, what were they thinking? It seems barbaric. This is the social justice movement of our time, and it's in our field and in our profession. It's an opportunity of a lifetime. And Robert Kennedy has a famous quote that I love, and he says, some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, and other people wonder what happened. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask you, are you going to make things happen? Or are you going to watch things happen? Or are you one day going to be one of these guys who is just going to not be on board with this, and the doors will close, and you're going to wonder, how did that happen? What happened? Because that's what's coming. So it's time to decide. This train is getting longer. It's not just nursing home providers anymore. It's all kinds of organizations, home and community-based, adult day, independent living, assisted living, and the consumers are coming. And think of yourself as one of those consumers. Forget your role as a provider. You are going to demand something um, be different. The current system is broken. And to continue doing what we're doing is absolutely insane. We're beating a dead horse. Thank you. I've enjoyed my time with you.